kind of got the idea because I feel like, uh, especially in this field, a lot of us um, fall into software project management. Um, it's not like a cool profession that you plan to get into, like dentistry, you know? You, like, you kind of fall into it like a bad of pudding. Um, generally, like if you, if you show some technical aptitude, you're nice and have a high pain tolerance at some point, someone's going to ask you to manage, manage a project. And when it happened to me, I was um, in my 20s working for the government printing office as a statistician, and someone asked me to do um, a project to um, get some new applications going for the, the website, and I really didn't know how to do that. So I learned the hard way, and I think that there's, it's a new field, but we've got a lot of data on what works, what's less painful, um, that I think that it's useful for us to share, especially in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Some of the things in our field are a little bit special. So I've asked um, some of the best project managers I know to join me in a panel. Um, they combined have a lot of years' experience, so if you arrange them like a Power Ranger, they basically be like the Yoda project <laughs> um, So we're going to start off. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, like what they what they're doing now, how they got where they are, and then uh, we'll kind of open up to the floor and to me for some questions. So I hope you have some interesting stuff to ask them about and get some experiences of your own to share. Would you like to go first? Sure, I'd love to go first. Hi, I'm, my name's Dan Chodnov. It's an honor to be sitting with these three people uh, in front of you. Uh, I'm glad we're just so close and not really far away. Uh, I'm currently Director of Scholarly Technology at the George Washington University Libraries. Uh, it's particularly uh, fun to see so many familiar faces from my years uh, working at a big library over on the hill. Uh, before that, um, I've been working in libraries for 16, 17 years. And uh, I became a librarian because I wanted to work on the internet and I wanted to do it in a way that uh, connected people with information. And uh, when I started, uh, sorry, I'm doing the right thing. It's okay, good. Um, when I started working at my first library job, I had a lot of ideas about how to make it easier for people to connect with information on the internet. And the uh, path to doing that was by writing original new software. So I, um, I, I cobbled together the O'Reilly books I could find and um, whatever snippets of code I could find and uh, built really bad software that uh, promised to do really good things and actually had a couple of early hits. Uh, for those of you who have uh, either the same or more gray hair than I do, uh, you might have heard of some of them way back when. Anyway, uh, the problem was that they were just really badly implemented because I was working in isolation. I didn't have any peers who knew this work like I did, which was not very well. And uh, the level, of, the scale of success I had in this work was far greater than my ability to meet the demand. So the, the projects I worked on in this first phase of my career uh, stumbled one way or another. The ideas spread, uh, products that eventually uh, did exactly the same thing but really well uh, came available on the commercial market and the free software market that sort of blew away what I had done. And I realized that that, that um, I'd sort of hit a crossroads where if I really wanted to do this better, uh, I needed to uh, work with people who knew what they were doing on a project that was set up to succeed and, um, and uh, sort of further my education by uh, building things that worked or at least figuring out how to. Um, so I went to work uh, at a different job on a project called DSpace, which some of you probably heard about, in a room full of really well-funded people, including a couple of really great engineers, particularly someone named Rob Tansley, who uh, is, uh, I think, happily in Paris working on the Google uh, sort of fine arts projects over there now, uh, if that's some indication of how good he is. Uh, and I really watched Rob closely, and I watched the things he would do and he wouldn't do uh, when we talked about an idea or a requirement and how we would react to um, some of our librarian instincts of wanting to have a standard for that before we figured out what the function should really be and how it should work for people, uh, and um, how we sort of gathered around and people gravitated like moths to a flame to projects that were well funded um, and not necessarily projects that were necessarily, that were specifically doing great work. Um, we were really well funded at the time, uh, so I learned in that project that there are some things that are really good about being well funded, some things that aren't. But after a couple of years working there, I had a much better idea of what a really good software engineer looked like. Uh, I hadn't quite become one at all. Uh, but I worked with someone who trained at it and practiced at it and had several successes. 
and I knew what I what I needed to do to get there. And what I needed to do was put my head down for five years and write code. Uh, so my next job, I spent. Um, I spent about five years at a research center at Yale University uh, School of Medicine writing software and being a, a full-time developer, uh, not a librarian, although the projects I worked on came to me because of my librarian background, um, understanding things like metadata, and search, and, um, and uh, some user experience issues. So I, I sort of had that package from my years as a librarian. Uh, but what I hadn't done was gone through the full uh, learning curve of starting new projects from basic requirements and goals and implementing them badly and then uh, re-implementing them less badly and less badly again and again and again until you have something that's good enough for people to use. And that um, term of five years doing that full time sort of got me over whether you buy into Matt Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours argument for expertise or not. That's about 10,000 hours of being in that uh, soup full time and learning about all the bad decisions I made all the way, on the way and how painful it was to correct them later on and which tools were getting better as I went and which tools I maybe should have avoided early on. Anyway, uh, at that point, I, I had become a good enough software developer that, uh, you know what, you, all, you guys all came after me. <laughs> well, the, the people who hired me aren't here, but um, people we all worked with before uh, hired me due, due to that experience. That I had the library background, I built things that were live and working on the web that people were using that hadn't gone away, uh, that were still running five plus years later, um, which I think is some milestone, major milestone. And I think maybe what we'll talk about more after I pass the mic over uh, is my years working at the Library of Congress taught me what it means to write big, complicated software projects dealing with scaled up data uh, on uh, reasonable deadlines where you uh, both create and manage expectations for people in terms of the degree to which you're going to meet requirements at a certain priority at a certain kind of pacing and actually working with the technical team to, to match those expectations on a consistent basis and what you get when you create a community around the idea that you can do this together successfully. Um, there's probably a lot more to say about that but I defer to David who I learned a lot of that from. I'm going to take the mic now, and I'm going to sing a little song. Uh, I, I, um, I'm going to fast forward through a little bit of my biographical background by saying I joined a software company, made some money, joined another one, lost it all, and then founded one, uh, and spent 10 or so years there before I sold it. Um, and those 10 years uh, were an interesting background in terms of software development um, because uh, it, much like an, another trend that was going on at the same time, um, which was online poker. Uh, so poker players, it used to be that to, you know, to play the thousands and thousands of hands that you had to play in order to become a good poker player, you had to get to be 60 years old. Uh, but when online poker came along, all of a sudden there were 26 year olds but played as many hands of poker as a 60-year-old professional poker player. Um, and my 10 years with Plus 3 were that for software project management. Um, it, was the, it was a deep end of software development that included um, constant, constantly managing multiple projects um, always for, for, for a period of 10 years. Um, I, one of the questions that, that I think Kate, Kate sent us some like ringer questions earlier are about whether whether it's different in galleries, libraries, archives, cultural heritage institutions um, to do software project management. And when I came to the Library of Congress six, a little over six years ago, uh, one of the biggest surprises to me was how comfortable I felt in the group that I entered. Um, there, there was a lot of the, the technical side of the work that I was very surprised was you know, pretty much at, 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 at or above the par that I've been working in the private sector, um, which 
you know, certainly when you're working in the private sector, this is not what they tell you to expect when you swap over to the government side. They, they, you know, I, I was expecting it to, um, to, to be a lot different. Um, so, so in that sense, there's a, a real synergy with what I was doing the, the, the 10 years before I came to the library. Um, but, but in another sense, there's a, there's a, a very striking difference which is that I don't work for an outside organization. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not, um, generally speaking, I'm not contractually bound uh, to, the, to the people that I'm working for. Uh, generally speaking, I can walk down the hall and, and ask people questions. Uh, I can, uh, if I'm you know, really confused about somebody's question, I can usually, um, either get them to sit at my desk or go sit at their desk and get a real clear understanding of both what they were trying to do and the way in which the software that we've built has succeeded or failed at that. Um, I will say, uh, like, like Dan, I'm a, a feral project manager. I, I don't have, um, you know, I don't have PMC certification. Lisa can tell you all about that, I think. Uh, uh, but I do have um, I do have a strong feeling that the way that we operate software development uh, at the Library of Congress is on the edge of something that will really work in organizations like the ones that we all come here from. And what how I would describe it is as a as taking some of the good parts of agile software development and some of the good, good parts of, of waterfall software development, sort of the, the, the methodology that we, that we used when I was in an outside, outside company, and uh, mixing them up in a bag and trying them. Since I've worked at the, uh, in the Repository Development Center, I think there have been 25 or 26 projects chartered, and maybe about half of those have, have been closed out as of this. Uh, is that about right? Like, uh, so, so we have, you know, maybe 10, 10 or so active projects right now, um, and 15 or so that that that, that we've gone through, um, and we continue to to iterate on the process, on uh, what sort of what works best. How do we best communicate? How do we best create momentum? Um, and and that, in fact, in a word, would be what I would describe the main similarity between what I do at the Library of Congress and what I did in the private sector software development is that a, a vast, the vast majority of the value that I bring to a project when, as, as a project manager, has to do with creating the environment where momentum can happen on a software development project. Um, and I think uh, the, the last thing that I would say is in terms of um, to, tools of the trade, uh, I, uh, I've used uh, I, maybe 25 or 26 ticketing systems during the time that I've been a, a project manager. Um, you, you, you've, all, you've all used one at some point. Um, if you're not uh, a software developer, you probably hated it. If you are a software developer, you definitely hated it. <laughs> um, but I, I would say, in, in terms of a of a, a tool of the trade, the ticketing system is for me as a project manager as important as version control is for me as a developer. And I think the two kind of go hand in hand. Um, so the, uh, what I would say, if I, if I've sort of taken if I can look back and see some continuity over the 17, 17 years that I've been doing it, probably those two things are the, the continuity and the tool chain, uh, ticketing systems and, and version control. Uh, and then the, the, I, I will close with saying that uh, I think ultimately thinking about software development as being primarily a technical Occupation um, is a is is a is a bad way to look at it. 
Um, I think that, it, you know, it'd be hard to put a percentage on it, but I think the majority of work to get momentum on a software project that has impact on the organization and completes in a time that is helpful to the mission of the organization, uh, the majority of that work is, uh, does not include checking in code or creating, closing, commenting on tickets. Um, I think it's a, um, Leslie Johnston and I were talking about this right, right before this panel, that um, there's a lot of the work of doing this, which just involves people getting in front of people, and which also involves software getting in front of people who are in front of people. So <laughs> putting the software in front of people while I watch and seeing what happens with it. And that is my spiel. I'll, I'll take over D the, uh, take the mic. Take the mic. <laughs> okay, you can have this one. Put this louder. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm Lisa LaPlance, and I'm currently the program manager for GPO's Federal Digital System, FDSYS. And I have kind of a, a slightly different path than, than my colleagues here of how I, I got to, to be in this current role. So I want to kind of tell you a little bit about that. And as I was kind of thinking about this, uh, this talk, I, I started you know, thinking about back over the years. I'm like, oh my gosh, I started at this. How in the world did I get to this? And I feel like some of you guys might be in a, in a similar position. Maybe you either graduated or started out in an academic environment, and then now you find yourself in a position where you're managing a large-scale software development project. So started out actually as a, a studio art major in college. Um, <laughs> all right, good stuff. Switched over to uh, a media arts and design degree, which is kind of a, the, an in-between um, it, kind of like a mass communication degree, but before a lot of the, the new media technologies that came out. Started out at the government printing office in 2001, was hired to do their kids' site. So it was right around the time where the federal government was really into having an online presence for, for kids. So I said, okay, yeah, I can do this. This is me who said, I'm never going to work for a large company. I'm not going to work for a big institution. I want to do you know, small companies, startups. And I find myself in a position in the federal government. But it was working on the kids site. So I said, okay, this is fun. I can do this. So this was my first kind of foray into software development light or project management very, very light. We had a goal, we had an objective, we wanted to develop early flash games. So I was kind of on my way. This was my uh, first real experience of showing out a product to a stakeholder or to kids and letting them play around with it and taking some of those lessons learned and, and starting into that iterative process. I think some of the, the training that I had when I was in the, the studio art major, that kind of helped out a lot. So I, I understood what it meant to stand in front of an audience and say, what do you think? and someone say thumbs up, or that's terrible, you can't draw, you should really be something else. So, either way. So I go along that path for a little while. I kind of move a little bit more into uh, marketing uh, type promotional items, uh, going out to conferences, speaking about the GPO's different online web properties. And that kind of takes me, doing a little bit of, of web development, very, very light HTML, CSS, that kind of stuff. So that takes me to about 2004 and I don't I think everyone has something in their career where someone says I need you to work on this and this is that project that kind of changes your path like you're kind of going in one direction you think you have it all figured out and something happens and it just pulls you in a totally different direction for me that was being detailed to work on the concept of operations for GPO's federal digital system at thesis so I was detailed to work on it as a subject matter expert. They said, oh, you know, you're available and you know the content matter and go off in this room and write a conops. I had no idea what a conops was at this point. So when we were, as I was listening to my colleagues, one, I had a, a person who um, was leading the team at the time. It's actually Mike Wash, who's the current CIO at the National Archives, and he is it, for me, it was a tremendous influence in kind of educating 
me and educating the rest of the team as to here's how, here's a methodology, here's one way that you can go about building software or managing projects. So we go through our concept of operations, we deliver that, we get into our requirements, so I'm out there, you know, working with stakeholders, finding out, you know, what requirements are and, and what stakeholders want to have have built with the system. Um, it's kind of, you know, getting into that that very waterfall approach to to managing software development. But at the time, that's all I knew, so I was like, all right, let's go with it. Okay, so we get a little farther along, um, kind of getting in the details. We, as an GPO, as an organization, ended up having a master integrator come in and you know, do a first shot at the, at the system. Bad idea, lesson learned. We took over, GPO took <laughs> over the project management aspect uh, of the, the program in, what are we up to? 2008. At that time, we had a formal program management office, which I have to say, it's, it was a great, great, great development for our organization, because instead of having um, individuals embedded within the different different organizations within GPO, you had a program management office where you had a set of, of like-minded folks that are all working toward a, how to solve these problems and how to manage projects. So the system launched in 2009, um, and I kind of moved into more of a role of a, of a product manager. So I've gone from artists doing web stuff, promotional stuff, kind of now doing product management, so I'm really out there talking with the customers, taking a look at our product backlog, managing our requirements. Moved on a little bit farther in time, and now we're up to 2011, ended up in the, the as the integration manager. So as I'm going through that, the whole project or, and, and product manager role, I'm Coming to, I'm starting to build more of my technical expertise, so I'm in there, and if I have a, a developer who's kind of have, writing a piece of code and shows it back or, or commenting on a design document, I needed to do what I needed to do to get my level of expertise up to where I could have the conversations with our development teams, with our infrastructure teams. When somebody says, you know, how much storage, what type of storage do you need? Uh, what type of environment is this? And can you review my Java code? You know, I needed to, to get myself up to that level to be able to at least have a semi-intelligent conversation, or if I couldn't, know who to bring in who could have that conversation. So that's the uh, integration manager role, so kind of pulling everything together. Um, at that time, I kind of started to, to do more formalization of, of um, the study uh, and discipline of project management. So. I, I, you know, studied, took a lot of, of classes with uh, related to project management, and got my PMP in 2011. Um, 2012, I moved into the program manager role, so you know, overseeing the the, the whole program, and then started to to get more into the agile development training, and and really taking a look at other software development processes, and and look for ways that we could optimize how we how we do software development. And that pretty much takes us to here. What a, it's a, but it's been a very uh, interesting, very fun, fun journey. Uh, I feel like, uh, you know, kind of looking back, I've had a slightly different role every year. And I, I hope it continues. Um, and I realized I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Kate's Ward. I'm a sort of manager in the repository development center with David. And Leslie's here in the pink shirt. She's our boss, so say, Nice stuff about us in the hallway. Or say whatever you want. No, 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 not whatever you want. Only say nice things. <laughs> so I've got a couple questions for these guys, but I'm hoping that you will jump in and, and have some questions of your own. So um, I'll start with, what's the job of a project manager or a project management as a discipline? Oh, that's for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll start. Or, yeah, you're the only one whose boss is in the room. <laughs> My boss is in another room. No, he's right in the back. Oh, oh. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll start out. You go first. I, I see a lot of it is, as the, if you were to, to say the number one thing is communicating. It's, it's every person that you can think of communicating with, it's communicating. Whether it's your stakeholders, your development team, among your development team, 
your business analyst, the whole communicating. That's that's the, the I would say, one of the, the biggest uh, things that a project manager has to do. And then kind of the more traditional things of organizing and managing and you know, uh, leadership type skills. You guys want to? Yeah, I, I'd like to riff on what David said earlier. In addition to what Lisa's saying about communicating, which is absolutely key and central, um, when I arrived at my current job working for Kareem at George Washington, uh, we didn't have a culture of software development and software development project management and having multiple projects going at different paces and different scales at the same time. So one of my jobs, I think, was to create a culture or as David said, an environment in which this work can happen consistently, reliably, in a way that uh, that worked for our colleagues uh, and ourselves, really. Um, I, I worked on two kinds of projects at the Library of Congress. Uh, one was uh, a, a series of projects largely managed by David as project manager that had clear milestones and we approached them at a steady pace. And sure, before each one, maybe I worked a couple of late nights. Uh, that was just to make sure I got everything done well. And then there was the other kind of project I worked on at the Library of Congress when everything had to be done tomorrow and I didn't sleep for weeks at a time. And um, I don't think that's an efficient way to exist in this world as a live organism. Uh, <laughs> it's an efficient way to accomplish other goals that are incompatible with that. Uh, it was not good for me. And uh, uh, yeah, so I didn't want to establish that kind of culture. Uh, I understand that these things happen in the government. I had experience with several projects like that, more or less. And these things just happen sometimes. You can't blame any one person. Uh, but I don't want to be responsible for that kind of culture at GW. I hope my boss and my colleagues, Laura and Dan in the room here, will agree that what we try to do, and I hope we're, what we're successful with, is uh, establishing through communicating as best we can clear scope and timelines for work and then a pacing of development that will allow you to reach those goals, uh, th those scope goals at that deadline without anyone uh, burning out or uh, uh, taking on uh, uh, you know, felonious thoughts and they're <laughs> at night when they're debugging and uh, can't sleep enough and they're worried about whatever's gonna happen the next day. Uh, I, I like to think we have a sane environment. People like to come to work in the morning. They know what their job is that day when they get there uh, and we, we can all relax a bit and enjoy what we've accomplished when we when we hit our you know smaller to larger goals over time. Um, that that culture is really important. I, I don't know how well we've done in spreading that culture. Uh, that's actually another good topic. I mean, we can come back to that. Um, but it's it's at least what Kareem has asked me to do and what I've been pretty well focused on for my first couple of years. Right. <laughs> well, that was, your, that was your good year review. Yeah, all right, great. Yeah. 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 I recorded it, yeah. Uh, David, do you want to add? Yeah, I, I, I think Lisa's point is, um, is, is a really good one, and I would, I would add specifically to that is uh, from, from years in, in private sector software development, uh, the really explicitly stated goal doing it in the private sector was to do it so that people would give you another project. Um, and the, you know, there's a little bit of a perverse incentive in, in the government because you, know, you, you do really good work and somebody gives you another project, your, your paycheck doesn't go off. And your, your <laughs> chances, are, chances are even your staffing doesn't go up or at least it's not, it's not a direct. Um, but, but I would say the, the job of a project manager is to do things in such a way that people will ask you to do more things. And then to do the more things in such a way that the people who are doing them will keep doing them. <laughs> and I think that's the, so, so on, on the one side it's the, it's the like keeping stakeholders, um, Sort of happy with what they're getting and getting what they're happy with, and then keeping the the project team getting what they need and also sort of happy happy with what they're getting. Um, I would say uh, over over the time that I've been at the Library of Congress, the one thing that I would add to that is that 
at the Library of Congress, which is, um, and, you know, every organization is different, but at the Library of Congress, the agency's mission is something that the project manager has to keep in mind. Um, it's not, uh, it's not a, a rigid hierarchy, it's not the military, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a rigid hierarchy where that sort of comes to you or that you can just ignore it. Um, but but so, so keeping the agency's mission in mind as you're doing a software project, I would say in a cultural heritage institution from talking to other people really is the work of, all, of everybody in the middle. <laughs> It's not a. It's not something that comes down from an admiral, a three-star three admiral, and per percolates through, but really is um, sort of c consensus from from a broad swath of people across the middle of the organization, and keeping track of that consensus, I would say, is another like a, a big part of what I think the work is. And kind of to, to add on that, you know, in, in addition to keeping the the mission in mind. Keeping the, the vision of the program or the project in mind, and keeping keeping the passion level high on your team, you know, like it's at least for for the team that you know the teams that I've been on in my career, I've been very lucky to be on on very passionate teams. So folks, they want to put in the effort, they want to want to put in the hours, you know, and it's almost kind of like what, you know, what, what was just said. Um, if you kind of have to look at the pacing also of your team. So sometimes you're on a team where folks are so passionate about what they're doing that they do want to stay up all night, that they do want to you know, put in this just amazing amount of effort, which is good in the short term, but then as, as part of the, the leadership of that program or project, it's, it's helping to set the pace. So what can we do as a team to have a sustainable pace? So not only can we do great things right now, but we can continue to do great things over time. One more uh, point on that, or maybe two. Uh, another aspect of uh, that that I think is really important is to understand your organization well enough to know what kinds of projects you can be successful in. Yeah. Uh, here, here. We're a small organization. Uh, you know, we have two full-time developer positions and two graduate students working and a number of peers in other departments we depend on for all of our work, but that's a pretty small team. But what we can do with that team is we can define a three-month project and knock out a new service, a new application that builds a capability we didn't have before and get it done on time and have it work. Uh, what we can't do is something at the scale of what these guys are doing. But I'll tell you, when I worked on that team with these guys, what we were really bad at is small projects. Maybe you'll change your mind about that. Every time I was directly involved in defining a small project, we could never get it going. We could never agree on scope. The goalposts kept changing, whether it was us changing it or not. And, and they were the source of as much service or stress as any other work we ever did there. Um, so there's got to be an understanding that uh, there's, there's a chute you can line yourselves up into, and that chute's got a different shape. And uh, I don't mean to rhyme. So I better just stop. The, the, the final aspect of that is to, to get really good at thinking about work and timing and pacing and learning to say no to certain things. Deciding what not to do is almost just as important as how you do the work you are going to do. I really like what David had to say about mission and what you just said, because I think part of the job of a project manager is not, is not only give the stakeholder what they want, but to help the agency further its mission. So sometimes that means saying no to somebody or giving them something that they, 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 they don't want or um, do you guys have, have any questions or like half-baked ideas you can just shout at me and I'll try to honor Yeah, the, um, I think I'm learning the answer to that. Uh, I, 
the, the main stakeholders I'm focused on are um, kind of threefold these days. One is uh, the GW community, which we can't ask direct questions of, but we can watch their stats and we can give them iTunes cards for usability testing. And, uh, see uh, when we're good, uh, what questions uh, get people stuck at the reference desk and so forth. Um, that I think we need to do a lot more work to get better at. Um, the other two communities are our peers in the organization, who I think frankly started with low expectations, and I'd like to think uh, their expectations are slightly higher now. Um, and I believe we can get a lot better at, at, at that aspect of it. Um, but lately one of our big growth areas, I think, has been working with the research uh, researchers at the university and reaching out to establish a connection with people who have not had people asking them how they can help them very often and have train themselves at scrapping and fighting for everything they get, however they can get it, and to show up uh, and not promise too much, but to find something that they need that you can provide and arrange some first steps where you can develop trust. And, and once you do that, not only do they start asking you for a little bit more, uh, but they start thinking about you as they plan for their next project, and they start telling their colleagues so more people uh, hear about us. Now this is happening very slowly, but I think it's fair to say, uh, Laura, you could confirm that it's starting to happen. That people are looking to us that we don't know necessarily because they've heard that we help somebody else. And to me, that's a huge win. That's, a, a, that's the way I prefer to build that relationship and manage it over time, is by constantly delivering on the promises you've made to the people you're already working with and being receptive and responsive uh, to additional requests from new people as you go. I hope that gets an answer to your question. Lisa, do you want to? Sure. So the, the stakeholders on, on the FDSIS for, for the FDSIS program, they kind of fall into 